Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Cares webcast series supporting family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver, certified dementia care consultant, and founder of McGill University's Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee the program, who include Dr. Jose Marais from the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Dr. Serge Gauthier, Professor Emeritus formerly of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. McGill Cares is supported by the Amelia Saputo Community Outreach for Dementia Care. Today, I'm very excited to, to, to discuss a topic of cultural implications of dementia around the world. My guest is Wendy Wiedner, Head of Research and Publications for Alzheimer's Disease International. She leads the development and growth of ADI's global research portfolio in partnership with academic institutions and Alzheimer associations for many projects, including diagnosis, dementia care pathways, interventions, clinical trials, epidemiology, inclusion, and diversity. She also leads ADI's publications, including the World Alzheimer Report and From Plan to Impact, a yearly report that tracks the progress of the Global Action Plan on Dementia. She works alongside ADI's Medical and Scientific Advisory Panel, a diverse group of dementia specialists who provide expert advice to ADI. Today, Ms. Wiener will discuss how dementia is understood in different cultures around the world and the implications that can have on diagnosis and treatment. Welcome to McGill Cares, Wendy. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here and really great to see you again to talk about a report that we did together. Yes, we did, because okay. McGill University was com commissioned to write the 2021 and 2022 uh, World Alzheimer's Reports, and I had the great privilege of co-authoring the report with Dr. Serge Gauthier, Dr. José Marais, and Dr. Pedro Rosaneda. So I'm really happy to be here and to be able to discuss this today. So, Claire, thank you so much for, for the introduction and for inviting me to be here to talk about something that I'm really very proud that we were both a part of. And... Um, this is talking a little bit about what we learned when we did the World Alzheimer Report in 2022. It was looking at post-diagnostic support and some of the cultural implications and things that we learned about how dementia is dealt with in, in different countries around the world. So I'm just gonna go really quickly through who Alzheimer's Disease International actually is, who we are as an organization. Um, we've been around since 1984 and we're the global federation of Alzheimer's associations across the world. So we have 105 members and about 20 right now that are in the development program. And we have official relations with WHO and the UN. But as Claire mentioned, we um, are known for our publications around the World Alzheimer's Report and for the work that we do about raising awareness during World Alzheimer's Month in September. And I know many of you will probably know these things, but I think it's always good to ground our discussions in what is really happening with dementia. And we know that it's an issue that's growing. Um, every three seconds, someone in the world develops dementia. We know it's a costly issue that we're, we're really in the next seven years, probably going to get to, to over 2.8 trillion US dollars that it's going to cost us globally. And we know that it's escalating. And by 2050, there will be 139 million people that are living with dementia. And also something that we'll be talking about, I'm sure today, Claire, is that um, there's, a, there's a huge impact of stigma. There's not a lot of awareness and understanding about dementia globally. And we did a survey for our World Alzheimer's Report in 2019, and we found that two out of three people still think that dementia is a normal part of aging. And more surprisingly, 62% of healthcare practitioners think that it's a normal part of aging. And if people don't understand that it's actually a condition that needs to be diagnosed and treated, they won't diagnose people and people will go without help. And this does have an impact on diagnosis because we have estimated that 75% of people around the world are not even being diagnosed. And this might even be up to 90% in low and middle income countries. So as, as Claire mentioned, this was something that we tackled in our World Alzheimer Report in two pieces. First, we in 2021, uh, we, we looked at the impact of diagnosis, but last year we looked at what happens after people are diagnosed. What's that pathway? What are the sort of implications of finding out that you are diagnosed with dementia on yourself as an individual, but also on the person that cares for you and your family? What are some of those sort of medical, emotional, and practical considerations um, and what 
are some of the sort of current, but also future uh, interventions that we can see coming down the pipeline? What's happening in terms of pharma, in terms of um, cognitive interventions and multi-domain interventions? And as Claire mentioned, we're gonna be talking a little bit about um, the cultural and societal uh, thoughts around post-diagnosis uh, support for people living with dementia around, around the globe and how important it is across the board to have education. And that's for people that are professional in working with, with um, people with dementia and their carers, but also for families and people that support them at home and in informal care. So there are a couple of chapters that I thought might be of interest that we could talk about. And I'm just gonna briefly touch on them. And I know that Claire and I will talk about them more, but one of the chapters in the report was chapter five, and it really looked, it broke it down, looked across 13 different countries about what are some of the issues that people face when they are either looking at a diagnosis of dementia or have a diagnosis and then trying to go through post-diagnostic care. And one of the huge issues that we found still is stigma. And I think that was across the board. Um, there's a lack of, of knowledge and understanding about what dementia really is and why it's important to seek a diagnosis and how to seek a diagnosis. And we also know that in a lot of countries, women are doing a lot of the care, um, the post-diagnostic care of people. Um, it's up to 70% of, of, of care, informal care is, is done by women. And this has a huge impact on their own health and it has a huge impact on their ability to work um, and, and th their own mental health as, as well. Um, one of the interesting things that I found in the, in chapter five was looking at how dementia is viewed in different societies. And one of the ones that I found quite interesting was um, looking at across North America and in indigenous uh, groups of people that they see, you know, Western medicine sees a, 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 it as a disease and, and, and their view is more like it's a transition and that it's, it's moving from uh it's a natural transition in life that you move into a place where you become more as you were at the beginning, more as you were as a child, and that this is a transition that needs to be respected. And the interesting um, misalignment that that has with Western medicine, when you think about, no, we see this as this is a condition that you need to treat and you might have to take pills for it and you have to get post-diagnostic support. And it's not saying that that's wrong, but what it's but what the chapter was saying was that actually there has to be a mutual respect and a meeting in the middle. There has to be this understanding that whatever we do in terms of assessments around dementia, it needs to it needs to be culturally appropriate. It needs to respect the views of people, the the, the culture that you're going into, and you need to find that balance between what how do people see that natural transition in life. And how can we bring in Western medicine to enable that to a person to live better for as long as they can and their, their family cares? Um, another interesting one for me um, was looking at a place like Madagascar, where there are very spiritual views uh, about uh, that what is happening to somebody when they have dementia and this, this fear around that, that it might be uh, a possession or demonic or it might be that somebody is actually um, having some sort of witch witchcraft um, sort of inflicted upon them. And that actually there's a role to play around raising awareness and understanding about this and how that conflicts again with a family that might have a diagnosis and go to get some support. And yet there are people saying that you have to go to an exorcist. And so it's about how Alzheimer associations, in this case, um, Alzheimer's Madagascar can raise awareness and help people understand, actually, this is a condition, but also look at some of the sort of more um, traditional ways of being in that society. So there's, I, I have to look at my notes because these are words that I don't always know, but they were talking about something like humanitude. So, you know, this is, this is us treating each other as, as humans. And it's, it's something called Valim Babena, which is around being grateful for those who came before us and treating people that are going through this transition, going through this condition with respect, and also having a form of 
uh, Vihavanana, which is um, mutual help and, and sort of support. And I know I've butchered those words. So if anybody's from Madagascar out there, I apologize. But but what it's saying is is actually that different cultures have different views about what people are going through. And it's trying to find that mix and meet in the middle, which is which is quite important. Raise awareness and understanding, but with a re respect for a culture where somebody is. Um, Right. And so, and, and, and just to get back to my slide, uh, just to say that, that something else that came out was that technology, uh, we found after COVID-19 that there was a huge amount of opening up for people, access to technology, actually access to understanding and education and, and upskilling that was uh, given to people in very remote areas, just by having access um, to, to the internet and being, um, being able to access training that they would never have had before. So, that's one part of it. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find my cursor. There we go. Um, then we also looked in another chapter at different kinds of initiatives and, and challenges. And I think that rather than belabor this, um, what, what we found is that there are a lot of, there's a lot happening out there in terms of post-diagnostic support, but there is no perfect solution and there is no one size fits all. And what's important is that we have to think about making sure that whatever care we provide is person-centered, that it's appropriate for the country that we're in, and that we really try to strengthen long-term care support. And long-term care is really um, the support that we provide somebody all the way through their, their um, condition, all the way from the beginning to the very end. And this is often seen as social care, so sitting beside health, but that to make sure that we integrate those is very important. And again, um, there's a section in this chapter in chapter 20 that looks at, at peer support programs. And there's a lovely chapter uh, by Alistair Robertson that talks about the importance of um, peer support in their group, which is called Dementia Alliance International, which is a group of people living with dementia who, who come together and provide that sort of peer support and advocacy work. And we work in partnership with them at ADI. Um, but having that lived experience Having somebody who can guide you through is so important. Um, and of course, we know that we need more data. We need more evidence. We need to understand more. So the quest continues on and on uh, to, to find um, research capacity and to find uh, solutions that work for different cultures. One thing that I wanted to share with you that came out of um, some of the work that we have been doing at ADI is an anti-stigma toolkit that we put, we helped put together with a project that we were involved in called STRIDE, which we did with London School of Economics. And STRIDE stands for Strengthening Responses to Dementia in Developing Countries. And there were seven different countries. Um, they're listed there, so I won't go through them. Brazil, India, Indonesia, you can see them on the slide. But one of the work packages looked at what the impact of stigma was across all of those countries. What were people's experiences and what can we do to raise awareness and develop some sort of intervention that would help create better knowledge and understanding and better behavior towards people who are living with dementia and their families. And so we worked on this um, over four years and it was actually, um, it was evaluated in Kenya. Um, last year and we found that actually this piece of work this this way of training people and raising awareness actually had a significant impact on the healthcare professionals that were working with people um and so just to give you an example these are some of the screenshots of um this toolkit it's there's a there's a link at the bottom of the page it's free uh, it's something that you can download and we're hoping that people will use it it's very practical it's very interactive it's filled with real case studies of people and also um, videos of, of people talking about their experience that you can use. And we're hoping, hoping this will be something that's very iterative, that people will use it and feedback and give us information because we want this to be better and better. So this is just one example of uh, something that has been used across seven different countries. And we're hoping just to spread the word on that. And one final thing, Claire, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish. I just wanted to um, talk about one of the things that we saw again and again um, through the report that we did together was this need for better training, better education, um, better strengthening of healthcare systems 
so that there is a clear pathway for people to enter in when they have uh, post-diagnostic support. And one of the ways that we suggest that this might be possible is through national dementia plans, because national dementia plans look at these areas that are on the on this sort of arc on the slide. It They talk about how to do better diagnosis sooner, how to have that clear post-diagnostic support, to raise awareness, to make sure that we have trained healthcare professionals that are working together in multidisciplinary teams, that we reduce some of the risks so that we can have fewer people developing dementia in the future, and that we track how we're doing and prepare systems for a drug breakthrough. Um, so that's it for me. And thank you very much, Claire. And I look forward now to stopping my sharing and having a discussion with you. Well, thank you, Wendy. And you know, what's what I found so interesting about working on the report, I mean, I call myself a caregiver crusader and I started this journey because of my own experience as a caregiver. Oh my gosh, probably in 2006. And, you know, I would look at Quebec, like living in Quebec and say, oh my gosh, in Quebec, this is what's going on. And then as I started doing more and more work, it's like, okay, no, this is not just in Quebec that the challenges are, it's in Canada. And then working on the on the world report, what I found fascinating is Dementia truly doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter what religion you are, what color of your skin you are, where you live. I feel like, you know, from reading the testimonials of caregivers, or as you call them, care partners, or and, and persons living with dementia, everybody is going through the same challenges, which are not understanding the illness, not being educated, care partners saying, like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to cope with this. And it really came out loud and clear uh, that that everyone, um, the lack of education that is not provided upon the moment of diagnosis truly impacts people. Yeah, and I think I think something else that that struck me was that people want to know what to expect. They just mm-hmm. want to know. Just tell me what I can expect, and it's it's not going to be the same for everyone, is it? Every, no. every person's trajectory, their journey, whatever you want to call it, is going to be different. But there are there are things that will come to pass. And I think it's, it's being able to be prepared. That's what people really need. They need to understand, what do I have to do? And, and also, how, what do I do if something happens? So how do I communicate? And that's what I, I also found very interesting is... Um, some of the training, some of the interventions that are done to help people communicate, to understand how to de-escalate um, situations that often people, things can become quite heated, but often that's because there's an unmet need. And actually, if we can figure out what that need is, then we can diffuse the situation and and how to help and support carers to do that um, is, is really important. And one of the interventions that uh, we is talked about in the chapter is also about this eye support um, care intervention that's that WHO developed, but um, that they're hoping to sort of turn into an online type of uh, support that people can sort of access and get that kind of, okay, this is happening to me. What do I do kind of support? But I think you're so right that people need that education. They need to be upskilled so they know what to, to, to expect. So for people listening, the world reports, both of them, the 2021 and 2022 world reports are available at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And they are incredibly comprehensive and real, really educational for the general public to understand the journey of the diagnosis and really what's out there once a diagnosis is made. And what I, you know, my role in being one of the, the authors being surrounded by doctors was trying to ensure that as much as possible, the report be written in a language that people could understand. Because I think that's the other challenge that people face is that, you know, when we receive a diagnosis, not only of dementia, the, the medical community speaks to us in medical lingo that we don't understand, right? And 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 and, and that's a problem, you know, that's, that's a big problem for people. Um, you know, when we talk about stigma, what I what I found interesting, you know, you had mentioned it, 
it's how also elders are viewed, you know, in different countries. You know, there are some countries where, like, like you know, you were talking about the indigenous population and how they really, you know, they, they do everything possible to respect the dignity, you know, to respect the care of, of elders. Whereas in other countries, you know, elders are viewed as a burden to society, right? They're, they're thrown into long-term care facilities with people. And I have to say that that basically, I, I feel like that's what's happening in North America right now in our long-term care system, where, you know, the, the healthcare system is burdened. You know, there, there's a lack of training of healthcare professionals, unfortunately, on how to care for people. You know, the, the whole. I mean, I remember when my mom was in long-term care. If I wasn't there to to watch over her, I didn't have the confidence that she was being well cared for. Right. So there's a big difference. I, I also feel like in countries of how the elders are viewed. Yeah, I, I, that's right. And I, I think, I think also there's this, I think you're right about, about higher income countries, maybe in, in, um, I think it's, it's like that here where I live in the UK, um, that there's this sense that people will go into institutional care that, you know, and, and I think that's a product of the fact that we're all living away from our parents. We all move to city centers and they might be in, in rural areas, but I think in, in, low and middle income countries, what we have found is that that institutional care isn't as well developed. And so a lot of people are being cared for at home. And so, um, and in places like, for example, in, in Indonesia, um, where our colleagues uh, from the Stride Project, but also that wrote in the report, there's this sense that actually, you know, elders are re well respected and you need to care for them in 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 your home, and and that's an important thing to do. And um, generally, as I mentioned earlier, it tends to be women. It tends to be daughters who might have their own family, or it might be a daughter-in-law who takes care of both sets of parents. And so, um, I think there's this responsibility, but it tends to be picked up then by by women, and that has a huge impact, a knock-on effect, I think, on their health but also it has an impact on their ability to um, contribute productively to society, to make money for themselves or to continue in work that they might be doing. So a lot of people have to quit their jobs or cut down significantly. And, um, and that has an impact then later on in life. I think if you're trying to put money away in your own retirement, you don't have the same sort of nest that you thought you would. So um, yeah, I think there's, in many countries, there's this view of respect and the sense of responsibility, but then the, that responsibility tends to fall to to women. And I, often I feel like it's the elephant in the room that nobody's talking mm -hmm. about that actually- Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. About that. And, and the fact that, you know, the majority of people that have Alzheimer's are women. Are women, are women. So, you know, I, I, I felt like when we were going through and working on this world, the world report as well, there's still such a lack of public awareness um, around the world about dementia with regards to like, you know, I don't know, I know, you know, I know country, there are countries that have tried to do maybe some public awareness campaigns, but I don't know who's seeing them and who's watching them, you know, and, you know, we, when we talk about, uh, you know, heart, heart disease or depression, you know, you hear about public awareness campaigns around that. But with regards to dementia, I mean, there's still not enough work that's being done. So, People don't understand the early signs and symptoms. Many people think it's all about memory. It doesn't have to start with memory. It can start with behavioral challenges. Challenges. So then there's that. There's also this whole stigma that why bother getting a diagnosis since there's no cure, which is so wrong because if you receive a proper diagnosis, there may be other health factors involved in are causing similar symptoms. If you receive a diagnosis, you know, hopefully the healthcare team can help you work towards living the best life possible, right? But, you know, when, when you look at your one of your beginning slides, 60%, 62% of doctors feel that um, dementia is nor a normal part of aging. It's not a normal part of aging, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, I, and that's why these public awareness campaigns, every, like the World Alzheimer's Month, every September, it's so important. And, and, and every year we've just it's it's increased and grown through the past, I'd say the past five years, it's just gone off the charts. The, the, the sort of programs that are going in all the different countries, it's amazing to see. And they're really translating a lot of the um, signs and, and um, symptoms and stuff all in different languages. It's, it's quite exciting to see, but 
it, ha it has to be more people. You're absolutely right. So that's one thing. And, and also we, your other point was about um, making sure you, you made one point about the, the awareness and getting a diagnosis, and, but getting the diagnosis in it, that actually that, excuse me, that people can actually live well with dementia for many years. I, I completely agree with you about the awareness campaigns. And this is why, you know, it's so important for us on a yearly basis to do this world Alzheimer month in September to make sure that we're, you know, giving our, our um, Alzheimer associations, the tools that they need to raise awareness in their own countries. And it's been amazing to see how they've taken that on and translating it to different uh, languages, et cetera. But equally, as you say about getting that diagnosis, it's so important for people to know what they know that they have dementia, know what they can expect, know where they can get help. But equally, there are things that people can do while they're living with dementia to make their life still rich and meaningful. And um, there's a there's a, a gentleman that lives down the road from me, his name's Keith Oliver. He wrote um, something in the report, lives down the road in Canterbury. And um, he, he said, you know, it took him uh, like four years to get his uh, care plan, but it took 15 minutes to write it, you know? So you think he waited so long, but then he had this wonderful care plan that he's shared with us before. And there's, it's filled with all sorts of advocacy work that he's doing and peer-to-peer um, -peer support that he's doing and um, writing. He does uh, poetry writing and, and he does painting. And so there's all sorts of things he can do to enrich his life and share through that process what it's like to live with dementia and raise awareness through, through that process. And so there's so much that can be done even when you have it. Um, it's important to get that diagnosed. Well, the 2022 World Report really has all kinds of incredible examples of people like Keith and also, you know, all kinds of post-diagnosis uh, ideas and ways to manage and, and, and really, really, it's very, not like some big non-pharmacological approaches. But I think the big call to action this year was the, the incredible importance of education and the only way that, you know, I think we feel that we're going to, well, you know, until there's a cure, it's about educating also the, the medical students of the future, the healthcare professionals of the future. They need to be properly educated on the illness so that they can, you know, explain to the families at the moment of diagnosis how they can manage. Because we, we, you know, when you look at a lot of the medical, medical curriculums, students learn about a disease, but they don't learn necessarily about the post-diagnosis management and care right and so it was a big call, call to action is you know for, for universities around the world to enhance their medical curriculums you know also the people who are working in long-term care facilities they deserve to be properly trained so that they can do the best job possible to preserve the dignity of the people that they are caring for as well yeah that's right i think and it's something that's a lifelong process isn't it i think that one thing that we haven't sort of figured out in the West is that actually you don't go for one training. People learn by, they, they go through a training, they learn by doing, but then they need to go back and get refreshers. So it's something that goes on and on, isn't it? And mm -hmm. things are always changing. You know, we're learning more about what works and what doesn't. Um, and, and I think that's important. It's important to think, right, from the very beginning, we should start even when, when people are young to learn about, you know, brain health and doing things that we can keep our brain healthy from the time that we're very, very young and, and demystifying some of the stuff around um, neurological conditions and, and talking about it, talking about aging and talking about um, dementia and, and, and normalizing it so that people don't feel like it's something that we have to hide, you know, and and by doing that, it, it then incorporates into a curriculum, like you're saying, so that, you know, we have it at universities, we have it in medical school, we have it in, um, you know, clinical psych programs, et cetera. And people are learning about it. And actually also what I, what I like about what you've done before is that you incorporate families and people that are actually living with dementia into the work that you're doing. So it's not just out of a textbook, but people are actually interacting able to ask questions and learn in that way is so important. Mm -hmm. 
And we have at the McGill Dementia Education Program a really important guide called the Dementia Your Companion Guide that it's now that has now been translated into seven different languages with many more coming. Um, I, we just finished translating it into also Punjabi. Uh, we've really? just finished translating it into Ukrainian. Um, so it's those will be posted over the coming months. But uh, we will translate our guide into as many languages as possible so that we could respond to the needs of various cultural mm -hmm. communities. You know, that's very, very, very important to us. Wendy, how could people access all the amazing resources at, uh, at Alzheimer's Disease International? What is the website? Uh, so it's www.alts.com. Int, so a l z i n t dot org, okay. yeah, and it's and all the resources are free and available. Amazing videos and reports, and uh, and I guess also people could register for some upcoming events um, or join your mailing yes. list. Yes, it, it'd be it'd be great because we do. Um, you know, I think one of the things that happened over COVID was we did some webinars, but boy, when COVID came, we started doing more and more webinars, and it's been amazing actually the ability to link in with communities that we didn't usually get to, to access and, and for them to ask us questions. And so we regularly do webinars. We have a, an international conference that we do every other year. You were at the, the last one in London. It was great. And um, yeah, please visit our website. And we've got, um, as Claire was saying, we've got videos, we've got um, the reports and, and you don't have to feel like you've got to sit down and read the 2022 report all in one go. You can go in and out of it because it's, uh -huh. it's a long one, but it's, it's that's what it's meant. It's bedside reading. Uh, thank you. So, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us all the way from London <laughs> today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Having so so this, this webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. If you would like to make a contribution to our program, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you would like to join our mailing list to be notified about upcoming episodes of McGill Care, as well as other important programs and resources from us, please email us at dementia at Thank you for watching.